Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Snippets. I am Josiah McComas, uh, your host in this Bible study. Uh, today, we are going to begin our series in the prophecies of the Bible, uh, specifically the end time prophecies. I've had a number of individuals and friends who've asked me to begin a series to teach about this, especially with the way the current world events are happening. Uh, it's brought out questions. And people are wondering, are we at the end of times? End times prophecy and the study of it in the theological world is traditionally referred to as eschatology, which simply put is the study of the end times. So today we're going to be discussing about the rapture, why I believe in the rapture, and we're going to be talking about the concept of the rapture. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We hear the account of the rapture uh, in other verses of Scripture, but this is the most popular form of Scripture and the most detailed form of Scripture in regards to the rapture. I am going to give the other Scripture references that do refer to the rapture because many proponents that are against the rapture uh, say that it's not talked about in Scripture, but it most definitely is talked about in multiple places. Uh, so turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 18. Uh, and I also want to give a little bit of uh, information here. So this is Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul had visited this church once uh, and had delivered the gospel. There was no believers when he first came to this church, absolutely none. Uh, and then after he left, uh, there was a great multitude of believers who took the comfort uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, led there. Now, through the teaching of the Apostle Paul, they, were, they had heard the teaching of Jesus' promised return. Just as Jesus gave us in John chapter 14, uh, they, they knew that promise. They knew that Jesus had said that he would come back for them again. And they had a question after Paul had left. Uh, he had left, and a number, a period of years had happened. And they just had this question wondering that some of the believers, those that had believed in Jesus Christ, had passed away. And they were concerned if they had missed the return of Christ. If this was something they had missed, um, like being in the ancient world, they didn't know if, it was, if they were supposed to have met, met in one certain place, how this was going to take place. So they had all these worries, and they were especially worried about their loved ones that had already passed before them. So the Paul, both in both letters, in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, is given a treatise to them. He's, he's talking about uh, some other ways, uh, how they should live an orderly life, but he's also uh, giving them comfort and talking specifically about the coming of Jesus Christ and, and the day of the Lord. And he's uh, reaching out first here. So we're going to read beginning in verse 13. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. So, I don't want you to be unknowing. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Those who have fallen asleep isn't the sleep that we're talking about here, uh, that, we, that we know uh, when we hear of someone falling asleep, it's are sleeping at night. He's talking about those who have passed away, those who are dead. So, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, unknowing, concerning those who have fallen asleep, passed away, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So he's getting on here saying, we have hope in Jesus Christ, and that's the beauty of the understanding of the rapture. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He emphasizes here again that it is the promise of the resurrection. It's the promise when Jesus rose from the dead. That was proof that we, would, as believers as well, would be with him. We would rise exactly as he did. How did Jesus rise? He did not just rise in the quote-unquote spiritual form. We know that through scripture. He rose physically. He rose in a bodily form. His physical body rose as well as his spirit. So we understand that today. Uh, we understand that through scripture. 
that it wasn't just some figurative or, or special type of resurrection. It was a physical bodily resurrection, and Jesus promised a physical and bodily resurrection for us. Thomas, Thomas touched the nail prints. He touched the side. Even we have, I think, three to four verses of scripture that even tell us that Jesus even ate with the disciples after his resurrection. So this was most definitely a physical one. And since he experienced a physical resurrection, we as believers will experience one as well. So again, verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So he's saying here that those of us who live at the time that the rapture happens, uh, the coming of the Lord, we will by no means supersede or precede those who have already passed away. He's saying, we'll go, but we're not going to go before them. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So it says here that Jesus Christ himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. Again, this is a fulfillment of the promise that Jesus gave us and that the angels gave us. I'm sorry, the angels gave us when Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. The angels told those who had experienced the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven that the same way he, they, they told them, the same kind of in the same echo that Paul did here, don't lose hope because this same Jesus who you saw go into heaven is going to return in the same way that he's going to uh, come. And that's what we hear here uh, in First Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. If you like to mark your Bible, circle that word rise there. Because that's going to, uh, that's a special word, to, to be risen up. That's to, 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 again, that promise of the risen Savior. We will uh, have the same with Christ. We will be as Him. We will be risen just as our Lord is risen. Verse 17 Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words again look at verse 17 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up that's the rapture that word there in the Greek is harpazo and it's translated caught up or catched snatched away so we will be snatched away. We will be caught up together, harpazo. Now, there's many proponents against the rapture. It says, well, the rapture doesn't exist because the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Yes, that's true. It's not in the English Bible. But you know what else isn't in the English Bible? The word trinity. But does that mean we don't believe in the trinity? Absolutely not. Because scripture testifies of the truth of the Trinity. You know what else isn't in the English Bible? The word Bible. Yeah, it's on the cover, but it's not in the scriptures themselves. So that, does that mean that we don't believe in the Bible? Absolutely not. That's ridiculous type of thinking. Just because the word rapture doesn't mean is not in there, doesn't mean that the principle of the teaching is not in scripture. We just use that word to reference it, just as we use the word Trinity to represent the triune God, the God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. That's testified in Scripture. So again, verse 17, And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We will rise bodily. We will rise physically. Uh, we will have our glorified bodies and meet the Lord in the air, and we will go into heaven with him. Um, I do believe in a pre-tribulational return of the Lord. 
I will go into that here in just a little bit. But there is some difference between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. And I want to make sure that people understand this because I think this is where some people do get confused with the rapture and the second coming. There is a difference between the rapture and the second coming. First off, right now, let me to, to, to qualify this, there is nothing else that needs to happen for the rapture to occur. The rapture is an imminent thing. It can happen at any point in time. It can happen at any minute. With the second return of Christ, through what we read in the book of Revelation, we have an understanding that certain events have to happen before the glorious appearing is sometimes referenced or the second coming of Jesus Christ on this earth. So we have to understand those principles. The rapture can happen at any minute. The glorious appearance when Jesus Christ comes back with his saints at Armageddon and begins his millennial reign. Certain things uh, have to have to occur uh, because of what we have been revealed to us in Scripture through um, the, John's revelation. So the rapture can happen at any point in time. That's very exciting. Now, a lot of people sit here and they'll say, well, that's scary. That's scary that that can happen at any time. It's not, prophecy is not something, and that's what people have a misunderstanding, and that's why I think that most pastors and most Bible teachers don't teach end times prophecy to this day because they're afraid that it's going to scare people. But here's the beauty of the message. The message of prophecy in the Bible is not one to scare us, but to prepare us. And that's for everybody, both the believer and the non-believer. To the believer, it's preparing us by giving us that fervor to share the message of Jesus Christ to those who don't believe. It's also preparing our hearts and hope for the soon return of Jesus Christ when we'll be caught up together with him in the air. It gives us that great glorious feeling to know that he loves us, that he's coming back for us, just as he promised in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He said that he would go and prepare a place for us, and that he would come back for us, and to have us in his own. He said, you know, how his father's house is full, and he would go to his father's house and prepare us a place, and that he would come back for us in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. And in the rapture, we see that kept promise, because in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, that was to believers. And we see that here in the fulfillment of the rapture, where he takes back the believers. So as believers, we have that. Now, how does it, how does it not scare unbelievers? I'm going to tell you that there may be some fear uh, in, in an unbeliever's heart mm -hmm. if they take uh, the teaching of the rapture seriously. But it's a healthy fear. It's a fear of the Lord, one that we read about in Scripture, one that gets us to action, but we it'll prepare them because they will finally see the love and the grace if, if prophecy is taught correctly, if end times prophecy is taught correctly and not one in an overpowering way. The message is powerful in itself. It doesn't need to be used to, to as a scare tactic. It, can, it gives a message of hope to the unbeliever that if they place their faith and hope in Jesus Christ, that they will be saved. And it's a message of hope to be done now. It, it, it reemphasizes the, the whole message of Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted people to make decisions then, not to wait. It wasn't something where he said, okay, you can go home and think about it. or do, No, the, the time is now. The time, if you feel the calling of God in your life, if you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, make that decision then. And that's the beauty of prophecy. Again, it's not used to scare us, but to prepare us. So we read that here all throughout um, the rapture. So what else is the difference between the rapture and the glorious appearance or the second coming? Uh, number one, we see Christ comes to his own. I already mentioned that. 
how Christ comes for his believers. Again, we read that in John chapter 14 and here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So at the rapture, Christ comes for his own, but in the glorious appearance, the second return, he comes with his own. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 14, when he comes at the time of the battle of Armageddon, it says that he comes with his saints. We read that in Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. So at the rapture, Christ comes comes for his own, comes to get us, but in his glorious appearance, Christ comes with his own. We're with Christ. Uh, the second point, he comes in the air. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he comes in the air, but at his glorious appearance, he comes to the earth. It, it says that his foot touches the Mount of Olives, and it splits in two. Zechariah chapter 14 tells us that, and Acts chapter 1 again gives us that promise that he comes in the clouds uh, of, again to the earth. He also, in the rapture, he comes to claim his bride. In the rapture, he comes to claim his bride. But in the glorious return, in the appearance, he comes with his bride. In Revelation chapter 19. At the rapture, only his own see him. Only the believers see him. Only believers see him at the rapture. But when he returns the second time, everyone's going to see him. Every eye will see him. Every eye and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone, believer and unbeliever, will see him at his second coming. So at the rapture, only his own see him. But at the second coming, every eye will see him. At the rapture, we have the removal of the believers. We have the removal of the believers and at the glorious appearance, we have the manifestation of Christ. We see him. At the rapture, pretty much soon after, I can't give you a, a, a pinpoint time. We do, again, I, I believe scripture teaches that the rapture will happen before the seven year tribulation upon this earth, that it's a pre tribulational rapture. Again, and I will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, basically, to sum it up, the Bible testifies that us believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 9, that we are not appointed unto wrath. Um, as a believer, the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ at the cross. We are not objects of God's wrath anymore. And that's what the tribulation is. It's God's wrath. Um, so why would he put his own bride, his own believers, why would he beat up his bride and then take her home to, to wed him? That's not how things work. He loves his bride. Therefore, he has not appointed his bride unto wrath. So he's going to snatch the bride away and then pour out his wrath upon the earth in tribulation. So, with that being said, sometime, rather, right, it could be right after the rapture. I mean, like the next day, the next few minutes. Um, I don't think so. Um, I, it could be a number of years before it happens. We, 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 there could be a gap of time between when the rapture happens and the tribulation starts. Because the tribulation period, when we go into that teaching, I'll teach a little bit more. But the tribulation period begins uh, when the Antichrist uh, signs a peace treaty with Israel. Um, and we'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about that. But at the rapture, pretty much the tribulation begins... But at the second coming, his millennial kingdom begins. So we have two differences there. And we read that in Revelation chapter 20. Um, at the rapture, the saved are delivered from wrath. I just taught about that. The saved are delivered from wrath. We read that in First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. Again, my favorite verse to talk about that is Revelation uh, 5 uh, verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, verse 9. Let me read it for you real quick. I'll just flip over. And it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And he again says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, 
just also as you are doing. So again, if we understand that as believers, that's hope and comfort for us. Again, not something that we need to be afraid of or scared of, uh, something that causes us to lose sleep over um, because we have an understanding. Uh, I, I've, I know a lot today, a lot of the believers, a lot of the fears that you have is because you're afraid uh, that you or your children uh, may experience the tribulations that we read about, the, the, the great judgments that we read about in the book of Revelation. But if you're a believer, if you're a believer, you have the hope that you will not experience that wrath, for we are not appointed unto wrath. Uh, that's the beauty that we read here, and that's why the Apostle Paul uh, gave us that. We can have comfort in those words. So, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So again, uh, that was uh, Jesus' promise to the church of Philadelphia, to the believers. And that's, that's our promise as well. And Jesus keeps his promises. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, stop worrying about the things that the Antichrist will be doing against those who are left behind on the earth. Look forward to Jesus Christ. What should be motivating you now more than ever is sharing the gospel with those that are not saved, with sharing the gospel to unbelievers. If you're worried about your children, share your gospel. Are you teaching your children the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you making sure that they have an understanding of who Jesus is? Are, are, you, are you making sure that your child is saved? Uh, that should be the motivation of prophecy. Not to scare you and just to make you worry and lose sleep overnight. No, it, instead it should motivate you uh, to make sure that you share the message with those that you care about uh, that don't have a relationship with Christ. So again, at the rapture, the saved are delivered from wrath. But at the second coming, the unsaved experience the wrath of God. Uh, the battles, the at the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus just has to speak the words, and the battle's done. It's over. That is harsh, and that is scary, because we all have those that we care about that are unsaved. And it shouldn't be there, again, to cause us an unhealthy worry, or to get us down and depressed. Because if we have, if we believe in the words that saved us, and we know these things to hold true, we should teach them and share them with our friends. Many people today, well, I don't want to offend my friends. Listen, this is a message of life or death. It could be offense to them. I understand that. But I know my heart, my conscience is clean because I've shared it with my friends. And I want to tell you this much. The friends that I do have, that I know that this message rubs hard against them sometimes because of the way they choose to live, they still respect me because they know that I believe this and I believe it so wholeheartedly. They know that I'm just doing it because I love them and I don't want to see them to experience the punishment that I believe will happen to them. That I know will happen to them and what scripture teaches us. My friends who live in the LGBTQ community, and I do have some people in my life, um, those who I've worked with, co-workers who have become friends, um... They will tell you that I'm still their friend. And they will tell you that I'm faithful to still teach this to them. I don't silence myself out of fear of offending them. I still teach them that the life that they're living in is wrong and contrary to Scripture. And they need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they understand that I do that in love. Not in a way that I'm saying that they're a horrible, disgusting person that I don't want to have anything to do with them. I'm just telling them that the experience that I had 
uh, that I was lost in sin, and Jesus saved me from it. And because of that, I have hope that I will live in, e in heaven with him eternally. We need to stop worrying about offending other people. We need to love them. And see, I think that's the disconnection, is that we have a false definition of what love is. People respect you more if you hold to your beliefs and if you hold strong to them. And, and that's what this is. So, again, at the rapture, the saved are delivered from wrath. But the unsaved at the, at the second coming, will, at the end of the tribulation, will experience the wrath of God. At the rapture, before the tribulation, we don't need any signs. But again, as I taught, that we need signs. Of the, uh, signs will precede the second coming. Um, in the rapture, the focus is the Lord and the church. But at the glorious appearance, the focus is Israel and the kingdom. At the rapture, the world is deceived. And we read that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. We read about a great apostasy. So at the rapture, the world is ultimately deceived. But at the second coming, Jesus binds Satan. So we see that in the rapture. So again, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the Lord in the air. That is the teaching of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So where else do we see this? Where else do we see this? I already mentioned John chapter 14 verse 1 through 3 where Jesus said that he would come back for us and take us home to heaven. And he's speaking specifically to believers at that time. And then we read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we sh all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet of Christ, the, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, again, we hear the... the Paul's teaching of the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, how about more? How about more? How about more? It some, seems that some uh, people <laughs> want to hear uh, other references. They need more proof. Well, there's plenty of proof. We know that raptures can happen, and they happened already in Scripture. What are you talking about? Look at Enoch in Genesis chapter 5. It says he was taken away. He knew not. He did not know death. He was raptured into heaven. Elijah in Second Kings. Elijah was taken away in a whirlwind into heaven. He was raptured away. Again, the word there, uh, when it was translated, when the Old Testament and, uh, was translated into Greek in Septuagint, guess what word they used? Harpazo. He was caught up into heaven. Elijah in Second Kings. We had partial raptures. Um, Philip. In the book of Acts, he was raptured away. He was taken away. He was caught up and, and then transported uh, where he uh, shared the message of Isaiah uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, a partial rapture there where he was caught up into heaven. And again in jo uh, John, Revelation chapter 4, uh, verse 1, we see that there most definitely is the rapture and the truth of the rapture. And it's something that we should believe in as uh, as believers. So, uh, to firm up this teaching, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 are the primary scriptures uh, that we use. But again, it, they're taught again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the, also the promise in John chapter 14. And we get it all throughout there. The rapture will take place before the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period upon the earth. Um, so the believers in Christ will not experience uh, the persecutions of the Antichrist. Um, those uh, Now, does that mean that the Antichrist, uh, that that... Christians will not, that believe today, will not uh, see the Antichrist or know the Antichrist. Um, 
the Antichrist could very well be alive uh, before uh, the rapture. However, he will not have a place of power. Uh, he uh, that won't. Uh, uh, he could be rising to that point uh, in, until we're raptured away. Uh, but the Antichrist will have no uh, form of power until after the church is taken away because he receives his power uh, what very little and mundane it is uh, from the evil one. So we can have hope in that. We can have hope in, in what we believe in here in the rapture. So the rapture will take place before the tribulation because again we're taught in First Thessalonians chapter 5 that we as believers are not appointed unto wrath and and you read that all throughout scripture on how Christ uh, reacts to his bride again it's just the simple teaching of this is you got to remember the relationship of Christ and his church the church is the bride of Christ it does not make any sense uh, for Jesus to allow his church to be uh, to suffer that type of wrath, to be beaten in that way, shape and form, and then snatched away for the bride. Now, there'll be some people say, well, Andy, you know, the church suffers persecutions today. Yeah, but it's, it's completely different from the type of wrath that is poured out on the earth during the tribulation. The persecutions that we receive today is the church come from unbelievers. It comes from the worldly. The wrath that is poured out in the tribulation comes from God and Him alone. Um, now, the Antichrist plays a part in it. Yeah, I understand. He furthers the persecutions. But the ultimate wrath, the ultimate judgments come from God Himself. In fact, Jesus Christ Himself uh, is the one who opens the seals in the book of Revelation, as we'll read when we begin our study in the book of Revelation and the study of the tribulation period. So, the rapture, when does it happen? No one knows the date. No one knows the time. Jesus told us that. No one will know the date nor the time. Now, I know the scripture, some people try to argue, well, you can tell the year, didn't say year. No, quit nitpicking. Jesus basically said no one knows the date or the time. And why? Why is that? Because of the teaching we read in First Peter. Um, God's merciful and he's gracious. He wants as many people as possible to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to accept his Son as, as Lord and Savior, to be saved in the Lord, to have faith, to place their faith in Jesus Christ. So he waits. He, 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 he's patient, as First Peter tells us. He's patient because he wants all to come to the knowledge. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance that all should be saved it's not his will that any should per be perished but that all shall receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so we have to understand that but is there anything that has to happen no the rapture can happen at any point in time and that's my message for you all it's not a message to scare you it's a message to prepare you a message to give you hope and it's a beautiful message, one to take out there. So my friends, let me ask you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have the confidence that if he came back today, if he comes back in the next few minutes, if he comes in the next hour, will you be raptured to heaven or will you be left behind? It's something you need to consider. It's something you need to understand. Jesus loves you, and he gave his life for you on the cross. We know we have all sinned. Every single one of us has sinned, and because of that we fall short of a holy God, and we're separated by that sin from him. But Jesus gave his life on the cross and atoned for our sins. He faced the wrath of God. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ on the cross, and he atoned for our sins through his precious blood. And the Bible tells us that we simply must believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must simply believe in him. We need to repent from our sins, repent from that old lifestyle that we had, and surrender ourselves in him in faith. There's nothing that we can do to earn his salvation. We simply have to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have faith that he has saved us from our sins, and heed his call. 
So if you hear that call from the Holy Spirit today, my friends, I pray, receive it, respond. Respond in your heart to the Lord and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words you have to say. Just pray to Him, expressing your faith in Him. You simply have, you don't have to say any magic words. I don't like to give a sinner's prayer, but I can give you an example. Again, this this isn't the words, this is just an example. You just simply have to come to Him. You don't have to come to Him in fancy talk. You can simply just go to Him and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I failed you. And I know I fall short from your glory. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And in faith, I turn to you as my Savior and my Lord. I pray now, save me and keep me so that I may serve you from this day forward. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. With the confidence of an amen, give that through. Now, like I said, you don't have to say that word for word. And I actually prefer that you not. It needs to come from your heart. Something similar needs to come from your heart. But my friends, take the rapture seriously because it can happen at any point in time. If you have any questions, if you need some help understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ anymore, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is josiahmccomas at gmail.com or you can reach out on the ministry email at scripturesnippets316 at gmail.com. I prefer you do reach out to my personal in this matter, josiahmccomas at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to walk alongside with you uh, to again further study the scriptures. Uh, We're going to go further into the prophecies. Uh, I will uh, continue to go up to date. We're going to be doing some studies in both the book of Daniel uh, in the book of Revelation, and of course other books, as you can already tell, uh, uh, prophecy is all throughout Scripture. I think when people hear of end times prophecy, they like to limit it to Revelation, uh, but it's it's all throughout the Scriptures, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to talk about that. And in fact, to have a, a, a firm understanding of the end times, we have to have a firm understanding of the beginning. So we're going to be talking about all those things as we continue our study. But that was our study of the rapture, uh, which is the next event to occur. Uh, So again, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know through email. Until then, uh, reach out, uh, look up, because our redemption draws nigh, my friends.